At American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Namdi Show, connecting your neighborhood with the world. I'm Mark Fisher, sitting in for Kojo. From the inner sanctum behind the crystal curtain of WAMU's glorious street front radio stage, the Kojo Namdi Show takes you to a place where memories live and the voices of another era never fail. Silent. The big broadcast is a grand and fantabulous 50 years old, and its proprietor, the golden voiced Ed Walker, is here to transport us days before television, when dramas like Johnny Dollar and westerns like Gunsmoke ruled the air. From the 1930s to the 1950s, radio nurtured the American imagination, and heroes like the Lone Ranger and Superman swept into living rooms across the land. For the last 50 years, old-time radio has been a weekly staple here at WAMU. On the big broadcast, heard Sunday nights from 7 to 11. As the station gears up for the 50th anniversary celebration of the big broadcast, we'll explore the history and power of vintage radio and the state of storytelling on today's airwaves. Joining me is the host of the big broadcast for the past 24 years, Ed Walker. He's been a foundation of Washington Radio for nearly half a century, going back to his long-running daily Joy Boys show with Willard Scott. And Ed, it's an honor to have you here in the studio and uh, ask you to talk about your lifelong passion for radio. Oh, Mark, good to be here. And uh, but whoever wrote that opening, it was... <laughs> <laughs> no, <it> was, was. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, you loved radio from a very early age. You even set up a small station yep. at your home in yeah. Forest, Illinois, when you were, what, eight years old? Eight years old. My folks gave me, they used to have something they called a phonograph oscillator. And what this was, was you could hook a phonograph into it and hear it on your radio all over the house with no wires. So I got one of those, and I was a precocious little kid. And I thought, I wonder what would happen if I put an aerial on there. And I did. And I found out that the signal was going all the way down the street. So I'd go down to the neighbor's house and say, I'm going on the air in a half hour, you know. That's how you got the audience. <laughs> well, uh, for our audience, if, if you'd like to ask Ed Walker a question, tell us about your old, uh, your favorite old-time radio show or who's doing uh, the best storytelling on radio today, give us a call at 1-800-433-8850 or email us at kojo at wamu.org. And Ed Walker, the... Uh, one of the reasons radio was so important to you uh, from the earliest age is that you were born blind. That's right. Uh, so did do you think you had a closer emotional bond with radio than your peers did? I do. I think so. I know today, a lot of most blind people really get into radio. And uh, I did because it took the place of comic books and newspapers, funnies and everything like that. And uh, so I've always enjoyed radio, all phases of radio. I would listen to uh, the comedians, the dramatic shows, and, of course, the kids' programs were, were dynamite, you know, the Lone Ranger and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I kind of grew up with it. And I thought when I was a kid, I was one of, on the radio, and I knew what I'd do that, but I had dreamed about it when I was growing up, you know. Yeah. And uh, so from Forest, Illinois, you came to Washington in the 1940s to attend American University, where you started a studio, a student radio station on the AM dial yep. that you called WAMU. <laughs> <laughs> a novel. Uh, I, yeah. I think the name may have stuck. I think it did. I think it did. Well, actually, I came to Washington earlier than that. My dad uh, was caught in the throes of the Depression, and he came out here for a, six months. He had a temporary job. And it lasted over the years. We never went back to Illinois. So uh, I went to AU. I started in 1950. And that's where I met Willard Scott. Uh, he, I was a year ahead of Willard. And uh, I'd been there about a year. And we had a mutual friend who brought Willard on the campus to look over the school. He was thinking of where well, he didn't know where he was going to go. And we met, this sounds hokey, but it's true, in the studios of the campus radio station. The first words I ever said to Willard were over a microphone. Wow. And it's yeah. continued uh, for all these many years. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you, do you still uh, have offices with him over at the NBC? I make phone calls for him. Uh, they, he's only on a couple times a month now. 
a week, and I'd make the phone calls from home. It uh, beats trekking into the NBC building. Since I moved, it's, uh, it's a longer ride than it used to be. Now, uh, of course, uh, many people know Willard Scott as the weatherman on Good Morning uh, America, but in, mm -hmm. in the 1950s and 60s, mm -hmm. the two of you hosted a destination afternoon radio show called The Joy Boys. True. And we have a cut from The Joy Boys right here. We are the Joy Boys of radio. We chase electrons to and fro. We are the Joy Boys of radio. We chase electrons to and fro. <laughs> And the Joy Boys was a classic uh, afternoon drive time show that really sort of captured uh, what was going on in Washington in those days. You did all sorts of gentle spoofs. You had a spoof of the Huntley Brinkley uh, newscast called the Washer Dryer Report. Uh, there was a, a character called Robin Hood of Rock Creek Park who right. took pleasure in piercing the illusions and picking the pockets of the city's self-important. Uh, did you guys write these bits together? How did they come about? Well, we ad-libbed them mostly, Mark. You, uh, you can't write a four-hour show. It's too much material. So what would happen, Willard was good at making up names and things like that. So uh, we would discuss what we're going to do while the records are on, and then we'd just ad-lib it. And, uh, you know, we worked together so long and so much that we knew pretty much what the other guy was going to say. And uh, one of the long-running bits was a soap opera called As the Worm Turns. How did yeah. that come about? Well, uh, there was a As the World Turns was on CBS. And uh, we were on in the afternoon at that time. And we we're trying to be topical. And we thought about that. Why don't we do a soap opera like that? And we call it As the Worm Turns. And here's what it sounded like. And now, the continuing true to life story as the worm turns, the story of life today in a big city hospital and all brought you by Scuff No More, the medical plastic product of the space age to spray your little children to protect them from other little children. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, the Joy Boys were on the air from 1955 to 1972 on WRC and then moved to WWDC for two years. Mm. And the show ended up in 1974. What uh, what, what caused the move of stations and, and, and uh, how did it all come to an end? Well, the WRC changed their format as stations are wont to do. So we got hired over WWDC, but it was a rough trip trip for Willard to get back to do his weather on Channel 4. So uh, well, he didn't last on that. We used to do the first couple of hours together, and then we would record everything and play it back the last half of the show. So uh, then he got tapped to go to New York to do the weather up there, and that kind of marked the end of our show. I mean, we're still together, friends and everything, but, uh, you know, that was the end of a great relationship. And the Joy Boys uh, was a show that was copied in uh, cities across the country uh, by teams of uh, uh, comically minded radio guys. And I went uh, a few years ago to listen to, there's a great archive of the Joy Boys shows at the Library of Congress. And I went over there to listen. And uh, there are bits that just take you right back to that time in <laughs> Washington. There was uh, one where uh, you had uh, a guy for the, from the auto theft unit. An actual, this was not a spoof, this was an actual detective from the Metropolitan police department auto theft unit who would come on every now and then to uh, report all of the stolen cars in the city uh which you could do in a very short amount of time in those days business is picking up though <laughs> it is that you'd, you'd have to devote an entire format to that uh, today yeah. uh but from uh, the Joy Boys, you transitioned over to being host of the big broadcast here at WAMU in 1990. And what brought you back to WAMU? Well, the show was originally started by a friend of, my, of ours named John Hickman. <clears throat> and I first met John when he was a teenager. And uh, I was doing an old record show on WMAL at the time. Uh, I think it was him. No, it was WRC. Uh, and he came by. He was interested. For a 14-year-old kid, he liked railroads, streetcars, and old records. How's that for a combination? Pretty good. He came to the station, brought me an old Paul Whiteman record, and that began our relationship. Then he used to come around and hang around the station. And uh, as a result of that, he got a job with uh, the station. 
and they were celebrating their 40th anniversary about that time. And they sent John up to New York to the NBC studios up there. They had a wonderful library of all these old radio shows, which were on 16 inch discs. So that John got the bug. He got into old time radio and after he'd done his stint in the army, he uh, got his job here at the station and the show was originally called Recollections. It was a little half hour show once a week, but it went on and on and on, became the big broadcast. And then around 1990, John had a premature stroke or something. He was much too young to ha have that happen. And uh, they knew that I was into old radio. And they called me and said, would you fill in for John? And I said, well, sure, I'd be happy to. And I kept saying, I'm Ed Walker for John Hickman. And finally, they said, you better knock off filling in for, because he's not coming back. That voice, uh, familiar voice, of course, is Ed Walker, the host of the big broadcast here on WAMU. I'm Marsha Zinfra Kojo Namdi. And let's uh, go to, by the way, you can watch a live video stream of this discussion with Ed Walker at our website, WAMU.org. <laughs> and here uh, in Purcellville, Virginia, is um, Diana. Diana, it's your turn. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. Yes. For, uh, I, my, my daughter's into the big broadcast, and we've been doing it since she was five. She's now 14. Oh. And throughout the years, it's, you know, you know, of course brought us together, but she will like a different show for a year and then like another one. Right now, she loves Johnny Dollar. <laughs> and I, of course, am stuck with Armis Brooks. And I, when I heard about the show on uh, the uh, celebration, I rushed to the phone. Oh, no. <laughs> I rushed to the Internet, and I was able to get front row tickets. And oh, I'm no. so excited. Well, I hope I get to meet you then Sunday afternoon, okay? Oh. Come yeah. up and introduce yourself to me. That's uh, this oh, Sunday, okay. November 2nd yeah. at 3 p.m. at Lisner Auditorium, the 50th anniversary celebration of the big broadcast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so well, excited. Well, thank, thank you so much. Thank you and your daughter. Appreciate it. Oh, it's wonderful to even hear you say that to me. I love your voice, and I feel so privileged. Thank you. All right, Diana. Thank you. Bye. And Bye. is uh, Diana talked about her daughter uh, listening in. Uh, what's your sense of the age range of people who have become attracted to the big broadcast? Very interesting, Mark. It's uh, wider than you might think. Uh, I was telling somebody a while ago that I get a lot of emails from all the kids have emails, you know, and I get emails from kids. <laughs> who said, uh, you know, I didn't hear these shows the first time around, but they like them. And uh, they, some of them say, they, we, we don't even turn on television on Sunday night. They like to hear the old shows. And a lot of them do what I used to do when I was a kid, take a little radio and put it under your pillow so your parents won't know you're not asleep. <laughs> and listen to the shows. Of course, when I was young, they had tubes in the radios, and that gave it away, you know. But now with these transistors, nobody knows, you know. Right. Uh, and do you think of yourself as, as having a great radio voice? I mean, obviously, in those early years, as we heard uh, in a couple of the clips, you did a lot of the, the spoof voices, the parody voices on the Joy Boys show. H has your delivery changed? Has your voice changed over yes, the years? Yes, yes. I can't do the women's voices anymore. My voice has got lower for some reason. I don't know. But it used to be that we could a lot of both of us in a myriad of voices on the show for a two-man show we had a cast of thousands you know and uh it was uh yeah I, that, that's a brutal realization when you realize you can't do what you used to do well you did uh, you did the characters on the show and of course you did uh, lots of commercials when you and willard uh, were on the air in the yes. evenings and that left days free to uh, freelance here's a here's a commercial you made for uh, dick harriman ford oh dear Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Burke, boy! What's bugging you? The Harriman Ford, sir. Yeah, well, what is it, Burke? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Where you button up with the old boy bit, Burke, and tell me what's all about? That's it, sir. What's this? Buttons. 
Hero buttons. I bought 10 tons of Harriman Hero buttons. You what? But, Mr. Harriman, sir, we're going to need them, sir. Hey, don't you bought them. People are sending their friends to Harriman, and uh, they're all demanding Hero buttons. 10 tons? Especially now with your fabulous board savings. Hero buttons? You're a jerk, Bert. And we're giving him a heck of a bargain, uh, sir. Oh, they, they, they like the low prices? Love your low prices, sir. <laughs> they, they like my trade? <laughs> Love your trade. <laughs> and they like being a Harriman Hero. Right on the bus, <laughs> Okay, Francis, you can have your buttons. No, I got them right here in the closet, sir. Be a Harriman hero. Send a friend to Dick Harriman Ford on Leesburg Pike, Lee 7 up in Tyson's Corner Shopping Center, but we exit 10 W or 11 S in Virginia. Let Harriman put a hero button on you. <laughs> well, complete with a whole bunch of reverb there at the end. And, I mean, just classic uh, radio. I do not that remember time. that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> there were probably quite a few of them. Uh, we're talking with Ed Walker, the host of the big broadcast. And when we come back after a short break, we'll be joined by Jack French. And we'll continue talking about the big broadcast and old time radio. Take more of your calls at 1 800 433 8850. I'm Mark Fisher, and this is the Kojo Nomdi Show. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Mark Fisher of the Washington Post, sitting in for Kojo Namdi, and we are talking about old-time radio with Ed Walker, the host of the big broadcast here on WAMU, and we're joined now by Jack French, old-time radio historian and the author. Uh, he's an author. He's the editor of Radio Recall, the journal of the Metro an old time radio club. You can join our conversation at 1 800 433 8850. You can also watch a live video stream of our discussion about old time radio at our website, kojoshow.org. And uh, Jack French, in the mid 1950s, TV came along and the old radio serials began to move over to TV or to die away. What did uh, those shows gain or lose when they migrated to television? Well, I think some of them became better, and not so. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> uh, and, and, of course, the same networks were running both the radio drama shows and the TV shows, and the money and the advertising dollars flowed to TV. So, And, and in some of those cases, I know at NBC in New York, uh, the production of the radio show literally moved across the hall to a TV uh, studio and uh, the actors went along and everybody else went along and it was this almost seamless transition, but it left radio with these enormous gaps and you know, what to put on the air. Not only that, but the scripts went with them too. Uh, a lot of those, uh, particularly the Westerns that migrated from radio to TV, they just rewrote the radio scripts that it became a TV show. And uh, Ed Walker, uh, we have an email from uh, Jonathan uh, asking, who were some of the best voices in the golden days of radio? And what's your personal favorite of among the various classic radio series? Well, uh, William Conrad had to be one of the kings. And Jack Webb. Of Dragnet fame. Yep. And uh, a lot of other shows. And as far as announcers, there are a few announcers who did the commercials, like Ken Carpenter, Harlow Wilcox, voices like that. Uh, a lot of actors, that's too numerous to mention, 
but they were so versatile, they could do just about anything. And uh, maybe, Jack, you have some favorites. I don't know. Yeah, I'd, I'd second what you already had. Uh, Orson Welles certainly well, that's was, right. was one of the great radio voices. And on the uh, women's side, uh, Agnes Moorhead oh, and Mercedes McCambridge were two of the most popular and skilled radio actresses. True. Ed, when you're opening the big broadcast every week, uh, you, you sort of set the mood by telling listeners to lay their troubles aside and settle in to enjoy the show. When you're doing that, who are you talking to? Do you, are you talking to people who know these shows or people for whom this is Just people new? in general, because the show is on at a perfect time of the week. It's the, I say, an island between the week just passed and the week coming up. Most people are kind of cool and laid back on Sunday night and uh, taking it easy. And uh, I guess it's to the people who listen regularly. A lot of other people are watching television. But uh, for, the, for my audience, I guess I'm speaking to them more than anybody. Let, and Let's go to Cal in Washington. Cal, uh, you're on the air. Hey, I got one quick question. Uh, I'm a younger listener, so I'm just captivated by uh, every Sunday night. But I was curious what your guests thought about early sci-fi radio shows. Uh, I love Twilight Zone, so that'd be uh, the most interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Dimension X was a sci-fi show, and uh, that was a followed up by X-1. And I don't know, there were probably other sci-fi shows. It was a show back in the 40s, and nobody can find it, Jack, maybe you know, called Latitude Zero. You remember that? Uh, I, I don't, but there's no. only one audio copy circulating of yeah. that show, I know. Yeah. And there were kids' sci-fi shows, Tom Corbett, Space That's Cadet. That's right, yep. And uh, so, which brings up the question of uh, what is the catalog like? I mean, how large is the choice that you have uh, to, to pick from each week? Uh, how much of the of what was on the air during all those years was, that, was actually saved? Well, that's a question, too. Now, a lot of the shows were destroyed. They were big discs, and they were owned part. Some of them were owned by the advertising agencies. And as they lost space, they just would throw those discs out. And some of the personalities would have copies made for themselves to hear their own performances. And uh, a lot of these old discs were uh, on the Armed Forces radio service, and the commercials were cut out of them. And a lot of those are preserved because radio stations saved those Armed Forces discs, and one of these days somebody would throw them in a trash bin, and some engineer would save them. <laughs> And so we have a big catalog of old radio shows. And uh, we don't worry too much about the royalties. There. I mean, there are some, but uh, it's been so long. The networks aren't the same as they were. Most of the artists are gone. And uh, so we just, we just play them. And uh, Jack, uh, as a collector, I mean, what, tell us a little bit about that marketplace. Is there a large number of collectors around the country, and what are the main sources of these uh, old recordings and uh, old uh, records? Well, it, it, it used to be independent collectors who would sort of uh, become a quasi-dealer, and um, they were selling both by mail and on the Internet. But the... Uh, uh, unfortunately for their businesses, um, most of these shows now that are available have been posted on the internet. Anybody can download them for free. Mm -hmm. So the, the, taking the value out of the value. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, it's expanded the old time radio community to include uh, a great number of people who never heard these shows, including the youngsters. And uh, Ed Walker, tell us a little bit about the. the, the, the first days of television and how it affected your work when when TV was there a moment when you knew that TV was going to uh, basically suck the life out of the old version of what radio was all about well, when you saw the networks and the, the shows kept dropping off um, you know one at a time one at a time and the stations were converting to records music and news and stuff like that you knew you could read the writing on the wall and the, the big money was in television and there wasn't too much going on. I remember that the Fibber McGee and Molly show was a big hit in the 40s. And so in the 50s, it was down to 15 minutes a day, five nights a week with no studio audience. They would, that was just a filler. So the big shows were, had gone too bad. And you were uh, in those early uh, days, you were 
I guess, already doing the Joy Boys uh, starting in the mid-50s. Yep. And uh, then Willard Scott got the job as Bozo the Clown in 1961. And so uh, that changed uh, the, the nature of your radio show, I guess, for a while. He sure did. I mean, he had to go in the studio a little early. As I said, he couldn't devote his whole time to our show because he had to go and get his Bozo costume on. <laughs> That hairpiece, which he hated. <laughs> I remember one time it, it tore, and uh, he patched it together with tape to go on the air. But anyway, that, that's another story. But he did that, and as a result of that show, he developed the character Ronald McDonald. Ah. He was the original Ronald McDonald. I never knew that. Yeah. Wow. Let's hear from Time in Columbia, Maryland. Time, you're on the air. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. I'm a big fan. Um, my inspiration and my love of radio started uh, in my early teens when I listened to Mystery Theater with E.G. Marshall. Mm -hmm. On CBS Radio. Yes, and I was wondering if you had ever met him or spoken to him, uh, and if he influenced you in any way, obviously you probably preceded him. No, I never met E.G. Marshall. As I said to earlier on the show, <clears throat> that program was one of the last vestiges of old-time radio. It was produced by Hyman Brown, who before that had done the Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Both shows used that squeaking door at the beginning and end of the show. So it was the last attempt to keep old-time old radio going. Thanks for the call, Ty. Thank you. And uh, let's, you. let's hear from Frank in Wheaton, Maryland. Frank, you're on the air. Yeah, um, I just like to, I've been listening for years and years I, I, I went blind uh, 31 years ago with glaucoma, and I've heard Ed Walker for 31 years. And I'd like to know who he is. Is he married? Does he have children? Is he around my age, which is 84? Uh, I just want to like to know who Ed Walker I feel like, since I've listened to him, like he's my brother. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm a little younger than you. Uh, I married uh, one daughter and five grandchildren. And that's about it. What more can I tell you? <laughs> You're a bit younger than me. That, okay, I appreciate that. A couple of years younger. That's and it. and for, a, for a blind man, I hate it when they say, uh, I am sighted impaired, you know? I'm really sighted and I don't see anything. <laughs> so if you're blind, you're blind, right? You do all this. In the gradations, right? Yeah. There you go. That's right. It, it helps me to, to get through the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. And uh, we have an email from Kathy who asks, is it possible to get episodes of Johnny Dollar on CD? I love them. Uh, Jack, do you know? Oh, yes. They're, they're available from at least 10 different Internet dealers. You can just uh, Google Johnny Dollar audio copies and uh, they're also available uh, for free if you want to search a little farther on on the internet and johnny dollar of course is a mainstay of the big broadcast sounds something like this i hope st peter's listeners this report may one day help qualify me for that path to the pearly gate this case almost rushed me up there <laughs> This is another adventure of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is just an expert at making out his expense account. He is an absolute genius. <laughs> Johnny Dollar and Ed Walker, uh, tell us about uh, Johnny Dollar. I mean, there are certain shows that you play a lot. Um, Johnny Dollar is obviously one of them. That's right. What's the particular appeal of that one? And, and tell us uh, about the others that you are kind of your favorites. Well, the one they played there was an early version of Johnny Dollar. The ones that we run are with Bob Bailey, <clears throat> who was the enemy of Johnny Dollar, I think. There were about five Johnny Dollars over the years. And uh, the Bob Bailey ones were the best, I think. And uh, we start the show out with that, and we're on the second go-round. We've run all of them, and we're rerunning them. And we're about ready to start the third go-round, because there are only so many shows available. And uh, so people don't seem to get tired of them. Same thing with Gunsmoke. How many, and Gunsmoke is another show that you play pretty oh, yeah. much every week. Every uh, week. And uh, how many of them are there out there? I mean, it, it, well, the show went on in 1952 and it ended in 1961, once a week with some reruns. How many would that be? I don't know. Uh, a the, lot. There, there's about, uh, there's over 400 yeah. shows in circulation. 
And of course, the advantage uh, to collectors today and, and the fans is that that was a transcribed show. It wasn't done live. It was done recorded, the mm -hmm. same as Fort Laramie was and the same as Frontier Gentlemen and uh, Have Gun Will Travel. And so, Jack French, when those share, uh, shows were aired live, did that make it less likely that anyone would keep a recording of them? Uh, no. And they, yeah. they, the well, the the early days, uh, we, we didn't really have a, a good method of, of recording shows until the after World War II. We actually got the technology from the Germans on tape, and then the uh, Bing Crosby was the first one to insist that his show be taped instead of live. That's right. Okay, let's go to uh, Sarah in uh, the district. Sarah, you're on the air. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to. To, to let you know that uh, I've been listening for a long time, but I'm I'm really excited because I've got a, a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a four-year-old, and my nine-year-old is really getting interested in Gunsmoke and Johnny Dollar, especially, great. and it's really great to be able to pass that on to the next generation. We don't we don't watch a lot of TV in our house, so he he loves it probably like other kids like TV. That's great. That's why we run those shows at the top of the show. So that the kids can go to bed. That's why we run Johnny Dollar and Gunsmoke in the first part. That's the heavily, most heavily listened to hour and a half of the big broadcast, I think. And Ed, uh, when you are choosing the shows, uh, I, I mean, what's your sense of, of the future of this? I mean, obviously, the, the number of people who remember the original broadcasts of these programs is dwindling. Yep. Uh, and so do you think there's enough interest out there to keep this going for generations? Well, if people like Sarah and get their kids indoctrinated in it, it'll last for a while. Uh, I, you have some younger people in the old time radio club, don't you, Jack? Yes, we do. Yeah, so it's it's perpetuated. I think uh, people enjoy it, and uh, as long as they can get involved with it and they can get the material, it'll last for a while. I think. I hope. But. I hope so. Uh, let's hear from David in Hyattsville. David, you're on the air. Hi, I just love the big broadcast. Uh, Bless um, your heart. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Ed. My brother-in-law, John Palmasano, introduced me to the show years ago, but you almost never play my favorite character, the Lone Ranger, Hyo Silver. <laughs> well, there's a reason for that, and Jack knows all about the Lone Ranger being, uh, uh, you know, the right, the copyrights and everything, is that right? Yeah, well, the Lone Ranger is still under, under total copyright, in which you can see these horrible Lone Ranger movies that come out of every two or three years. <laughs> but uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, enjoy a recreation of the Lone Ranger. It's a parody uh, at the WAMU 50th anniversary at Listener Auditorium on November 2nd. We'll be doing a, a parody of the Lone Ranger uh, with the full manual live sound effects done on stage. And that uh, show, of course, is uh, Sunday, November 2nd. As Jack mentioned, it's at uh, Lisner Auditorium at 3 p.m. It's the 50th anniversary of WAMU's longest-running program, The Big Broadcast, and it's a salute to Ed Walker in partnership with the Metropolitan Old Time Radio Club. There will be sound effects demonstrations, mm -hmm. vintage microphones, a history of old time radio in which uh, Ed will be speaking with Rob Bamberger, the host of Hot Jazz Saturday Night here on the station. And for ticket information, you can go to WAMU.org. The question that guy had about the Lone Ranger, there are a limited number of shows that are fall under that category. Most of them are, I want to say, public domain. They're not really, but uh, George Trendle was had enough foresight, I guess, to copyright those shows, and his estate has them. Same thing with Hyman Brown. So the does that mean that the networks that originally produced or aired a lot of the series that you run on the big broadcast no longer own the rights to those shows? A lot of them, and those networks hardly exist anymore. Like, so there hardly is an NBC radio. They gave all of their old radio shows to the Library of Congress, and uh, Mutual is gone. CBS is different under different ownership. It's all different. So that that enables you to air those, yeah. those shows. We uh, take a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and, Are there, and the copyrights have, have, uh, have ended on most of them because at the time that these shows aired, they had copyright protection for 49 years. 
of course, now all of that. Oh, yeah, forever. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Pretty much. And, and so are there other programs other than the Lone Ranger that we don't hear because of uh, rights issues? CBS Mystery Theater, we don't run them because it's Hyman Brown show. We have run the Lone Ranger occasionally. We take a chance. Inner Sanctum we've run. I can't think of any other ones. Uh, the, the Shadow. The Shadow. The Shadow is still yeah. under copyright. Yeah. It's owned by Condé Nast Corporation now. And The Shadow was one of the last shows to be revived. I know there was a, a, an attempt in the 70s uh, to put, put it out on radio. Um, yeah. So our guests are Jack French, old-time radio historian and author, and, of course, Ed Walker, the host of The Big Broadcast. When we come back after a short break, more of your calls at 1-800-433-8850, and we'll talk about some of the other shows that are part of The Big Broadcast. I'm Mark Fisher, and this is The Kojo Nomdi Show. <laughs> Coming up at one, the ethics of Ebola. Doctors and health officials debate fast-track drug testing and best practices for quarantines. Today at one on the Kojo Namdi Show on WAMU 88.5 and streaming at kojoshow.org. Welcome back. I'm Mark Fisher of the Washington Post, sitting in for Kojo Namdi, and we are talking about the big broadcast and old-time radio with Jack French, an old-time radio historian and author, and Ed Walker, WAMU's host of The Big Broadcast. And we have an email uh, from Mary Jo in Bethesda who says, I lived in Cincinnati and listened to old radio shows on WVXU, and when I moved here in 99, I was so happy to hear The Big Broadcast. Ed Walker is such a gem. We are lucky to have him and his vast experience. Best wishes. Similarly, Thank you, Mary Jo. Uh, from uh, Virginia, I'd like to know if Ed has ever heard Cabin Pressure from BBC Radio with Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> no. Jack, have you ever heard of that? Well, I, I have not, but BBC, of course, it, enjoys the luxury that we don't have here in America. They still have. And that uh, they still have dramatic radio on several channels on BBC. And uh, there is something of a resurgence of at least some of the old styles of storytelling on even on American radio. Uh, this American Life comes to mind. They they you know, have a serial program uh, that uh, is a podcast called Serial. Uh, these are not uh, fictional scripts, but rather nonfiction presented in, in that old style of storytelling, in a sense. Uh, is there... Prairie much? Home Companion is exactly. another one. Yeah. yeah. They, what, they have skits in their show where they have the, the lives of the cowboys and stuff like that. And they rec recreate some... Not recreate, but they do old radio shows. And they do it in old type radio shows. Yeah, they do it very much in the style yes. of, of old time radio and uh, live and performance on mm -hmm. the stage with a live audience, that right. sort of thing. And, and manual sound effects. Exactly. And, and manual sound effects, obviously, one of the most charming aspects of old time radio. And uh, Jack French, tell us about uh, how those shows were put together with, with who, who's there on stage beyond the actors. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to do on listener stage pretty much what you'd see in an old-time radio studio of the 40s, and that is they have the actors around vintage microphones uh, with their scripts in their hand, and most of the audience will probably be watching their sound effects table <laughs> because they have all sorts of unusual and interesting uh, tasks in order to create the sounds that are needed. I mean, the traditional one, of course, is the horse's hoofbeats with coconuts. 
but we've got uh, a number of other manual sound effects that uh, I, I think will delight the audiences. And do you have sound effects artists who worked back in the day, or are these uh, newly uh, trained people? They, they, well, they're they're newly trained. They're not that young, but uh, <laughs> they they haven't worked actually on radio. But they've been doing this for about twenty years for um, both our Metropolitan Washington Old Time Radio Club and also you know, giving advice to community theaters who are putting on old radio shows. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from Nora in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Nora, you're on the air. Thanks. I'm uh, such a big fan, Ed Walker, of, of your show, and I appreciate this. I wanted to ask more about the voices, uh, especially women's voices, because I've become such a big fan of Virginia Gregg, who's on Johnny Dollar a lot, and oh, George yeah. Ellis. And I wonder, maybe Jack knows this too, if there's resources that more about these women and their careers and, um, and how they fared sort of in the TV era as well. Look them up on Google. There'll be a lot about <laughs> Virginia Gregg. No, I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, Virginia Gregg was a very prolific actress. She was on everything and uh, very versatile, too. I've heard her on Gunsmoke, where she's an old woman, and uh, on Richard Diamond, she's a sexy girlfriend of Dick Powell's. You know? well, that's she's a, fantastic. Your, your question is almost a lead in for my, my first book, which was uh, Private Eyelashes, Radio's Lady Detectives. And if you get a copy of that, you'll read of the uh, careers and lives of uh, 40 or 50 of the women. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the call, Virginia. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Nora. And um, we have an email from uh, Lynn who says, thanks for the big broadcast shows, especially the coverage of D-Day. And uh, I'm sorry about that's this. okay. We've got a phone going up. Uh, uh, Ed Walker, tell us about uh, how that coverage of D-Day came along uh, on the big broadcast. Well, uh, there was a lot of recordings of that, and that uh, D-Day was, uh, most of the networks did a great job on it, and uh, the interesting thing about that was the NBC coverage, I know that Robert St. John, who I happened to meet shortly before his death, uh, ran all night reading bulletin after bulletin, and uh, the thing about the, the news then, and everybody was uh, very hesitant to say the invasion is underway. They were saying, we think, you know, they, weren't, they don't do what they do now. But all of the networks did great coverage on that. And so we put it together one year. We did the whole it, and uh, it seemed to go over very well. People wanted, wanted to relive that. That's back in 1944. That's a long while ago, but uh, we should never forget it. And here's uh, Bert in Bethesda, Maryland. Bert, you're on the air. Thank you. Um, I have two, one comment and one question. Um, I'm very surprised at all of the parents calling about their children being fans because everybody says that children no longer have the attention span that they used to. Um, second, there was a show called Monitor Radio. Yeah. It was on in the 50s and 60s. And it was my introduction to Fibber McGee, Abbott and Costello, Duffy's Tavern, Jack Benny. Bye. And uh, by coincidence, it was um, on your station uh, at WRC. Right. I'm wondering if those are still available and if originally they were uh, originals or old clips? No, I think they were originals. Monitor was created by Pat Weaver, who did the Today Show and the Tonight Show. He was kind of a genius in that regard. And uh, there may be some monitors still available. I think they have a website on the Internet. Uh, I don't know. It originally, in its original format, was 40 hours. It started on Saturday morning all the way through Sunday night. And it was designed for little stations who, uh, you know, little stations, local stations, who couldn't afford to keep people on duty all weekend, so they would carry Monitor. <laughs> this was on NBC radio. Yes. And uh, Monitor continued well into, I think, into the 80s. Yeah, right? it changed uh, formats over the years, but yeah, it lasted a long time. Everything you'd want to know about Monitor was compiled in a, in a new book uh, under that title by a friend of mine, Jim Cox. Oh, yeah. So if you want to Google Jim Cox and his uh, book on Monitor, that should answer practically all of your questions. Good. 
And, and Jack has written a couple of books too, Mark. You know, he has. He uh, tell us uh, what's your focus of the latest book. Uh, my latest one is uh, Radio Rides the Range, which is a uh, uh, discussion, encyclopedia style, of every Western radio drama from 1929 to 1967. Okay. Wow, what an undertaking. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, here's an email from Ursula uh, saying, I've loved the big broadcast for years. However, I've missed Lama and Abner. When I think about why a show might retire, though, I wonder if sometimes the content is dated in a bad way, not a nostalgic way. Some of these shows are from a time when women and minorities got worse than a raw deal. Uh, Ed, when you're selecting programs, do you think about sort of how standards have changed over the years? Oh, yeah. I have that problem. And Lemon Abner, I have mixed feelings about that. There are those who love it, and those who say, I'm glad it's over. <laughs> and it was, it was well, we're thinking of bringing it back, but uh, a case in point, uh, a couple of years ago, we, you know, Indians are not treated very well, and like on gun smoke. They're referred to as savages and so forth and so on. And I got a letter from an Indian representative who said, uh, that's in very poor taste. You shouldn't do that. So I called this person on the phone and explained. I said, that's the way radio was 50 years ago. And, and they said, rightly so, you should do a disclaimer. Well, I've started doing that. And the same thing with the black uh, people. Like Amos and Andy is the one program the WAMU won't let me run. And I, because blacks I, are portrayed in a yeah, uh, very servile way. I thought Lemon, uh, uh, Amos and Andy was a hilarious show. And they had a beautiful Christmas program, but I can't run it. But they were on television, and uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know why they won't, we won't do it here. But uh, it was a good show. Well, let's uh, hear from Hamid in McLean. Hamid, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, just wanted to make a comment that uh, we used to listen to Johnny Dollar in Iran, dot in back in the sixties and the seventies. Wow. So you, so it was the actual American broadcast of Johnny Dollar, and then you would hear the Farsi on top of it? We would hear the Farsi the, the version of it, and we used to call my mother Johnny Dollar because we could never get away with anything. She was the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, dear. Thank you. Thanks for the call, Hamid. Absolutely. And uh, here's Ted in Washington. Ted, you're on the air. Um, I have a strong recommendation for Ed Walker. My favorite radio show of my youth was the comedy show Allen's Alley. Oh, yes. Fred Allen and his wonderful character. Uh, Senator uh, Claghorn? Characters. The only thing comparable to it today that we have was the Republican candidate's Debates of 2012. <laughs> okay. It reminded, reminded me of Fred Allen. Can you bring him back? Oh, I've, we've run Fred Allen. Uh, that Allen's Alley was a segment of his show with uh, Senator Claghorn. Uh, who was based on Everett Dirksen, I think. Is that well, right? Well, it could be. Yeah. Kenny Delmar did it. He did a beautiful job. And then Titus Moody, Moody was a guy named Parker Finley. And uh, he was terrific. And then Minerva Pius and other people with the fourth member. That was a great uh, comedy bit. Is it harder to bring back uh, those sort of variety shows than it is the dramas? Are they, is there, do they feel more dated, those variety shows, because they were more topical? Well, they are dated, but when you're doing a show like mine, you're dealing in the past anyway, so it doesn't really matter that they're dated. Uh, that's why, for one reason, Jack Benny's humor uh, is timeless. It's dated to a point, but it's still funny. And uh, some of those shows, yeah, are dated. And Bob Hope always managed to keep his shows kind of timely, although he would, his monologues would uh, uh, talk about the happenings of the day and so forth. But I think people want to hear that. And uh, Ed, here's somebody who uh, I think uh, says he knew you way back when, Oral in Washington. Oral, you're right here. Hello. Hello there. Hello, Oral. How are you, buddy? How are you today, Ed? Uh, I want people to know I met Ed first. Here we go. And he was a senior in high school. <laughs> and Where was uh, that? He was into the radio bit already because uh, Ed was a uh, Ed. You were uh, in your senior year at the Maryland School for the Blind, and uh, 
So that, well, you were already told when you went to college. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, there's obviously the late 40s. And he was a member of the wrestling team there. And he made a trip to take part in a tournament in far away, at least in those days, far away Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the thing that really impressed me was the fact that before the tournament and even after the tournament, all the fellows who were there from both that school and other schools would gather around him because he was always standing in the corner somewhere mimicking, you know, the Lone Ranger, portraying the Lone Ranger or the Green Hornet or some of the other really popular radio characters of that day. And uh, just, uh, you know, practically uh, doing a story right then. Oh, boy. Well, well, you remember the old days. Yeah, I guess I was sort of a ham even then. (laughs) Well, it was entertaining, and the the fellows all loved it. And then, uh, my goodness, the years uh, slipped by, and after I went through college and law school and came to Washington to work, Turned on the radio. Who did I hear but Ed Walker? See, well, as a lawyer, he amounted to something. Uh-huh. I'm on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the call, Earl. And uh, quickly, here's Hank in Arlington. Uh, you're on the air. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, Ed and Jack both know me. I'm yes. kind of a ringer because I'm a volunteer at WAMU and a member of the Old Time Radio Club. I wanted to give a shout-out not only to Virginia Gregg, but also to June Foray. Oh, yes. Uh, one of the most talented ladies, and I think she's still around. She is still living. And also, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Bob Elliott, who's still around, because uh, he and Ray. Ray Goulding, he and Ray Goulding did some of the most hilarious things that yes, I've ever did. heard, including send ups of uh, active TV uh, radio shows from the time. Yeah. Thanks, Hank. And uh, Ed, uh, just in the few seconds we have left, uh, what was the influence of Bob and Ray? On, on, well, on that, well, I guess we kind of got our encouragement from Bob and Ray. They were, when they started, they were kind of unique. And uh, Will and I kind of developed our pattern after Bob and Ray. Not that we copycatted them, but uh, they were terrific. They were great. Our guests have been uh, Jack French, old-time radio historian and author. He, he's the editor of Radio Recall, the journal of the Metropolitan Washington Old-Time Radio Club. And, of course, Ed Walker, the host of the big broadcast, Sundays from 7 to 11 here on WAMU. And a big 50th anniversary broadcast is coming up, a celebration at 3 p.m. on Sunday at Lisner Auditorium. I'm Mark Fisher sitting in for Kojo Nambi. Thanks very much for joining us. Mm-hmm.